Hello everyone, bonjour à tous, and welcome to this, our first Google News Initiative for Africa event. We are delighted that so many of you are able to join us all over the continent. We will be coming together at the same time every day of this week for an exciting program of talks, workshops, and Q&As all about the news industry in Africa. The Google News Initiative is Google's effort to support news publishers in the digital world. We have been working with journalists and news execs in the region for several years, and we are so happy to be increasing the scope of training available, and what, that's what we want to share with you here today. Before I forget, please make sure you are using the hashtag, hashtag GNI Africa at Google for Africa. Coming up this morning, we will be having Google's Managing Director for Sub-Saharan Africa, Nathan Gadria, host a panel of experts to discuss how we can all support the next generation of African journalists. You'll hear from Guy Verger, Director of Strategies and Policies, Communication and Information at UNESCO, Khadija Patel, Head of Programs, International Fund at Public Interest Media, Kobas Lawrence, Strategy Director and Co-Founder of Food Form Zansi, and Professor Monica Chibita, Professor and Dean, Faculty of Journalism, Media and Communication at Uganda Christian University. I'm really looking forward to hearing the ensuing discussion on this important topic. Following this panel, I'll share more details on the workshops taking place this week. You can come to as many as you like, they're all free to attend and we look forward to seeing you. But for now, I'm delighted to hand over to Google's President for Africa, the Middle East and Europe, Matt Britton, to welcome everyone to GNI for Africa. Welcome, Matt. Welcome to the Google News Initiative for Africa. Years ago, I sat in a dark tin shack in Soweto and I watched children learning languages and discussing the news, their faces were lighting up around a few smartphones and tablets. And lighting up people with knowledge, information and inspiration, that's at the heart of what news organisations do. As a former publisher, I know that firsthand. So I'm really delighted to welcome all of you today to look at what more we can do at this critical time. It's an absolute honour to bring news organisations from across the spectrum together, from national and local to digital and print, all in this virtual event. There's no doubt that the last 18 months have been incredibly challenging for news organisations too, both in Africa and across the world. The pandemic has changed the way people interact with news and it's accelerated that shift to digital. But at the same time, it has reinforced how vital your role is. There's never been a time when access to good quality journalism has been more important. And to help the public stay up to date with what's going on, to make informed choices for themselves and their families, it's really vital. At Google, we're hugely optimistic about the future of the African news ecosystem and we're committed to supporting it and doing everything that we can to help you adapt and ultimately to thrive in this new digital world. Working with UNESCO today, we are announcing a UNESCO Global Initiative for Excellence in Journalism Education. This programme will seek to establish, to define and to implement the local definition of excellence in journalism. We'll work with 100 different journalism schools and shape the training of 4,000 journalists. I'm so looking forward to seeing this in action. And I'm really delighted the UNESCO Global Initiative is joining the roster of other programmes supporting journalism right across Africa. As you may know, we've now held two rounds of our Innovation Challenge in the region. They've funded 43 projects in 18 countries. I've been incredibly inspired by the way diverse African news organisations have embraced the move to digital and are amplifying African voices in a new way. Organisations like Pulse in Nigeria, who have used new digital formats to engage a mass youth audience. Pulse is leading the way, using formats like explainers to provide additional and very much needed context to the flow of information. As a publication, they're constantly innovating. They're working with the audience, they're trying to engage to understand what they want, what they want to get out of their news. Another amazing example of this is Food for Mzanzi in South Africa, 
who believe that no story is too small or insignificant to hear about. They built this amazing network of citizen journalists in the most remote rural regions of the country and encouraged them to understand how news gathering works and the value of quality journalism. In doing so, they were able to tell stories that otherwise would never have been heard and picked up multiple industry awards along the way. I am delighted that both Pulse and Food for Mazanzi are joining us this week, along with many other exemplary news organisations. In the next few days, we'll also introduce you to some other ways we're supporting news organisations and journalism in Africa. You'll hear from our News Lab team, who have already trained 11,400 journalists across the continent on advanced reporting and verification skills. And our digital growth programme and news consumer insights teams will tell you more about our training in topics such as reader revenue and audience engagement following our pilot programme in Nigeria last year. I can't wait to share it all with you. So thank you. Thank you all for being here and for making everything possible. I hope this week is useful and enjoyable and we look forward to working with you to bring more African stories to readers everywhere. Le indlela yam olu luambo lam ta sibe amse ne singenza ngono sibe amisa nge sebe lotando isandla slambe singe ndi akolwa. We want to give rural communities the word, the opportunity to tell their stories in a way that only they can. <laughs> Food for Mzanzi, at its core, is an agricultural news publication. Our mission is to tell the untold stories of South African agriculture. And that mission has made Food for Mzanzi become a bit of a movement in the South African context. Agriculture in South Africa is a very easy stereotype to use to divide people. But we spotted in agriculture the potential for something to unite South Africans. <laughs> Most people consume news and their idea of news is it's only news when it's dead or when it's bleeding. Food from Zanzi has become a bit of a revolution, proving that often good news or news with a smile can sell. We knew that we wanted to have a national project, but we did not foresee the cross-section of participants. The aim of the Citizen Journalism Project was to, number one, empower and also develop. It puts people at the heart of the community to tell their stories. Mateka! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Mateka was one of the first that applied. She had a passion for storytelling, for talking about issues that plague her community. Kailicha is the largest township in Cape Town. It has a very high entrepreneurial spirit. When you are a content producer, the main aim is for you to understand the people's needs. I've been wanting my stories to be heard. So I grab the opportunity because I know that I can tell stories but I needed basics. Understanding that there are different types of storytelling, different media platforms to tell your stories to, that you can even maybe create your own platform. The Google News Initiative Fund helped us with this project by backing us financially. And really without their support, we wouldn't have been able to reach all these people within these rural communities. It's very important that we are able to tell our stories in a way that anyone can understand and in a way that is truthful. It has empowered me to empower others. It is not the easiest thing selling hope. It's not the easiest thing selling a primary black audience to, to advertisers. I don't think our work is done, but I definitely feel like we've made a, a dent in it. We break barriers for black women in agriculture, for people who look like me. The unknown heroes now are known through this platform and website. Citizen journalists are literally at the center of the community. They make sure that these stories in these rural areas are really told on a national platform. That is why this program is so important in South Africa. What an inspirational way to start the morning. You can hear more about this from Kobas, who's on our panel. As Matt mentioned, we are thrilled to be launching this important initiative with UNESCO, 
to discuss that and other ways in which we can support the next generation of African journalists. Please welcome Nitin Gajria, Google's Managing Director for Sub-Saharan Africa and our panel of experts. You're very welcome, Nitin. Sanvanani from Clarence in the Free State of South Africa. And thank you, Dorothy. I am delighted to be here at the first GNI for Africa event, discussing such an important topic uh, with, with an extremely wonderful panel. As Dorothy said, I'm Nitin Gajria. I'm the Google Managing Director for Sub-Saharan Africa. I've moved to Africa about two years ago uh, with my family. And in, in the two years of being here, and I still consider myself a relative newbie on the continent, but in my two years of being here, one of, the, one of the most important assets for me in order to learn about the continent, in, in order to learn about the different the the continent, to learn about different stories on the continent, has been the continent's journalism. I've had the chance to interact with, with journalists all over the continent, read their stories, and that's been an incredibly powerful tool for me to learn about this incredible continent. Um, which is why I'm so pleased today to be discussing how we can help support the next generation of African journalists to grow and nurture African voices and hear more about their stories. Uh, so let me, let me start by introducing the panel. We have an amazing panel lined up today. Uh, first up, we have uh, Khadija Patel. Khadija is the chairperson of the International Press Institute and the head of programs of the International Fund for Pu Public Interest Media. She's an experienced journalist who has been published widely and was formerly the editor-in-chief of South Africa's Mail and Guardian. She's passionate about the enhancement and protection of media as a public good. Welcome, Khadija. We also have Kobus Lawrence. Uh, he's the co-founder and strategy director of South African agri-news and lifestyle platform Food from Zanzi. We just saw a wonderful video from them. As an award-winning journalist, he has published leading magazines and community newspapers in both South Africa and East Africa. As the co-founder of foodformzanzi.co.za, he believes in the power of agriculture as a bedrock industry that can enhance social cohesion in a divided country. Welcome, Kobus. We also have with us Professor Monica Chibita. Uh, professor Chibita is a professor and dean, faculty of journalism, media, and communication, and has been the coordinator of the Norhead Capacity Building Project at Uganda uh, Christian University since 2013. She has served on several boards, including Uganda's uh, Broadcasting Council, the New Vision Printing and Publishing, the African Center for Media Excellence, the East Africa Communication Association, and World Vision International. She has been the associate editor of the Journal of African Media Studies since 2006 and serves on the editorial boards of several other journals in the field. Fantastic to have you with us, Monica. And we also have with us uh, Guy, uh, Guy Berger. Uh, Guy heads up UNESCO's work on press freedom, safety of journalists and journalism education and training. He also leads UNESCO's work in countering disinformation He's a former media columnist with the Mail and Guardian newspaper and also head of, uh, head of the School of Journalism at the Rhodes University in South Africa. He co-initiated the Highway Africa Media Conference and also set up the Saul Plaki Institute for Media Leadership. Uh, welcome, Guy. Welcome, welcome, everyone, to this wonderful panel. And let's kick right into it. Um, Let's start off with uh, the announcement that Matt uh, just made. Um, Guy, I'd love to hear from, from you about why this announcement is important and why it is important in the current context. This initiative, it's always been important that journalism education uh, has uh, been a feeder into journalism. And today, it's even more important that you have you know, quality and excellent journalism education feeding into make journalism more excellent. And of course, the world today is not what it was even three years ago. Uh, but 10 years ago, UNESCO did a, 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 a consultation with 100 journalism schools around Africa to say what back then was excellent. 
And they came with three different points. And they said the first is it's got to be a good curriculum that mixes theory and practice. Second, it's got to be have connections. A journalism school should be connected to the media and it should be connected to the rest of the society, the communities, and so on. And then the third thing was they said a, a, a good journalism school, an excellent school, should be forward looking. So uh, now, to what extent have these changed? To what extent have these? Uh, been uh, uh, subjected to um, stress and tension over the years. So, for example, we could say that when we looked at back in 10 years ago, we said that there was too much theory and too little practice in the journalism schools. And so excellence meant that the journalism schools should have more practice. And probably today people would say that's the same. But the question is what kind of practice? So with this Google News Initiative, we're going to consult the, the journalism schools and say, so today, uh, of course, the kind of practice journalists need today, much more than they needed before, is how to verify content, because there's so much content that is fabricated or unreliable or gossip today. So you know that's one new thing that needs to be done in terms of uh, practice. But what about other things like producing journalism? Should journalism schools be uh, telling or training journalism students how to do video through TikTok dances that can tell a story, a journalistic story that's fair, that's uh, verified, that's communicative? Should um, uh, journalism students and young journalists today understand more than ever the economics of journalism because there's such a crisis of funding journalism in this new environment? So these are the kind of things we want to come out with with this project. What does it mean to be excellent in journalism education today? And then after consulting these 100 journalism schools across the continent, we'll ask them to say, how do they match up against these criteria of excellence? And the top 10 who come with a proposal to be closer to excellence will get a grant to, to move forward in that regard. So that's why this thing's important, because it can make a difference to the survival and the excellence of journalism and the role of journalism in Africa today. Thanks for that, Guy. Um, let me switch over to, to Monica. Monica, Guy, Guy touches upon an important topic of changing behaviors as far as the format in which content is consumed uh, today, especially among young people. How do you see some of this play out in, in the university context? Uh, you, you're deeply involved with a lot of young aspiring journalists. How do you see some of this uh, changes in um, content consumption behaviors playing out for, um, for aspiring journalists? Hmm. So we, our university runs a new, has been running a newspaper, a print newspaper called The Standard. And we used to print 3,000 copies for distribution to all students and, and staff and the community around us. Right now, about 85% of those copies are, are just not touched by anyone, even if you make them available. They, they are supposed to come and pick them up and, and, you know, but nobody comes, nobody's interested because they are getting their information differently. Um, we also see that in class, if you're, teaching, if you're teaching people to write for newspapers, there is some passion. But if you bring in a visiting, a guest lecturer who understands the way the new media environment works and can speak about the way they prefer to communicate and be communicated to, you become irrelevant because they are so excited to be in touch with this person who seems to be operating in their world. Um, so I, I, see, I see that then influencing the way we package our curricula. In fact, we have a curriculum retreat coming up in November where we want to revamp our curriculum again to see how we can align our content much more to, to, this kind of, uh, to these kinds of skills and these kinds of environment than, than we had before. That's 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 really interesting. Actually, Khadija, I have a the, the next question. Really, is following on from that um, the lines between being a social media influencer and being a journalist? 
are more blurred today than they've ever been before. What, what are your thoughts on, on, on some of this? Yeah, I mean, I agree they might be blurred, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid that, you know, journalism done on media platform can be above the norms and standards of what we expect of journalism done on in a newspaper, etc. I think that um, we are in an exciting phase, I think, in news media. Uh, and there are new forms, there's such, uh, you know, beautiful experiments, I think, with the news being done. Um, and we have to almost lose some of our fear, I think, uh, for the future of journalism. That as, as a human society, we understand the need for news and we know that people will always need the news. We know that, that it is a fundamental human need. I think in order to live full lives, we need information about the world around us. And though the forms of, uh, you know, the way people access that, you, you know, that, that information changes drastically. And certainly the way my 21-year-old sister accesses the news, which she says completely through Snapchat, which worries me a great deal, is very much different to the way I access news. Um, we really have to understand, I think, as and as just media development, how best do we create news products that are accessible to people? Because we can have the most beautifully written story, but if no one is reading it, it's just an exercise in vanity. So we have to constantly, and, and I think that this is an opportunity for us, the moment that we're in the profound crisis news media is in around the world, is an opportunity for us to assess how best do we create products for particularly young people. I think it's quite exciting. Thank you. Which, sorry, Kobus, I, I, wanna, I wanna come to you. In your, in your journey with food from Zanzi, you know, which is really sort of built through community journalists, how has some of this played out in your journey with food from Zanzi? Yes, I definitely wanna agree with um, Khadija there. We are in a, in a really exciting space. And for, for us, I think we've seen the, the benefit of diversity um, play out you know, on, on, a, on a number of different levels. That, um, for us, it's about representation, you know, it, letting, allowing people and inviting people to tell their own stories. And, and from representation, you get um, relevance. You know, so, so, so more people find you uh, credible and, and, and relevant to their, to their lives. And then also, um, there's, for us, there's resilience in, in being diverse. You know, it, it, it's kind of like um, Khadija said, um, you, you kind of have to find the platform where people want to be uh, spoken, spoken to. And a diverse um, group of journalists together allows you to, um, to, 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 find those, to find those platforms and to, and to be more experimental. And to um, to kind of avoid being trapped in these kind of stories that we tell to tell ourselves of what is news and uh, what is the prevailing narrative in a in a specific um, community or a, or a country or in our case in in a in a niche, you know. So so it's a it's the world is changing at a dizzying pace, and I think for us part of Dealing with that is is trying to be more diverse and more representative, because that brings options, you know, to to consider. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite uh, authors. Sorry, guy, you wanted to, you wanted to come in. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. I I want to just give a caution, but uh, this is a, exactly the kind of debate <laughs> that we 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 must have. Uh, the caution is this, that I think if the aspiration for journalism is to give, to, to produce an informed public, you also have to realize that some, uh, there are different levels of information. And, you know, a, a person, uh, with due respect to Snap, Snapchat, I'm not sure how deep the person's level of, of information would be there, because the problem is if you just have snippets of, of, of information, um, it doesn't give you that depth. And at the same time, often 
if information is is sugar coated with entertainment, then people are are yes, they get into the the, the the vitamins of of information, but sometimes the sugar is rutting their teeth. <laughs> So, so we have to be a little bit careful about this, and I do think that these influences on on social media they also um, they sometimes they are very different to journalists or to the ideal of journalism. They don't disclose uh, that they are sponsored, for example, um, and so then you have a kind of information that's that's dishonest information, even a kind of disinformation. So much as we have to explore these more formats. This is the challenge. If you want to keep journalism in the new formats, you've got to figure out what is the trade-off, and at what point mm. does it mean that the, the journalism actually loses? Uh, and I agree, we can't do journalism as we used to do it because there's no point; people won't come. But we can't immediately rush into some other kinds of, of business and leave all the principles behind. It's the middle ground. <laughs> Well, this is what we want to get from the journalism educators. Who is using um, very creative ways to be excellent in doing journalism, but in these new in this new world? And and maybe so, our colleague with Mzansi is is succeeding. But I I, I see Khadija is jumping in here. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Guy that uh, a real a real danger of some of these social media platforms and some of the you know some some of the content delivery mechanisms in these um, in these mediums is a lack of depth. I agree entirely, but um, I but I also I mean my argument is I think that what we have to understand is that perhaps we will have a greater variety of news uh, news sources and news types genres so that, that those short and snappy things will still exist but not in isolation or not in or not discounting the need for proper in-depth investigative journalism documentary storytelling etc um and guy i agree entirely uh, like it's it's shocking sometimes you know for me to even look at fashion storytellers and look at their lack of uh yeah, you know, a transparency around where they're getting their stuff. It, it's so obviously sponsored content sometimes that is not, uh, you know, that has no, uh, you know, declarations about that. Um, and, you know, in South Africa, for example, we have the Advertising Standards Authority that have particular rules and regulations about this. Um, and it's not, well, I mean, it's not well policed on social channels, especially in South Africa, as far as I can see, I'm, you know, happy to be proven wrong. But I think that guy, perhaps the challenge for us is, as a particularly, you know, when we think about our press councils and our broadcast, the BCCSA, etc., how do we install guardrails for these platforms? How do we ensure that our existing regulatory mechanisms are growing and evolving themselves to meet new realities? Look, this. Uh... This is a fantastic debate, and I think we could we could go on uh, go a little bit deeper in this. There are two sort of branches of this conversation. There was uh, there was a mention of stories, diversity in, uh, in in the narratives, and that sort of reminded me of one of my favorite was, uh, ever uh, uh, Nigerian author Chimamanda. Uh, she talks she often talks about the danger of a of a single story, right? And uh, uh, Kobus, you touched upon. Uh, upon sort of that, that diversity of voices uh, in, in storytelling. Uh, I'm curious, and maybe, maybe I'll go, go, go to you first, Monica, on this one. Um, what current state of diversity in journalism and what is it that we need to do to make sure there are more diverse voices, there are more, there are more stories from, from different parts of Africa that we will hear uh, as we sort of see young, more and more young journalists uh, come into the profession. Yeah, so I'm going to sound a little bit like a dinosaur here, but one of, I think one of the, the things that seem to be nibbling away at diversity is the, the youth demographic bulge in a, in a, number, of, uh, in a number of countries in, in Africa. And so you have the youth kind of taking over the news space. And, and that I think, while we wanted the youth to come on board, I think that can also go overboard. 
The other thing, of course, is the linguistic diversity and the fact that not all of it can be represented for commercial reasons. A guy knows this is a favorite subject of mine. Um, and then, uh, of course, we have cultural cultural constraints from certain types of diversity. So there are some subjects that are not discussed in public and so on. And some sometimes then the regulation clamps down on those. So, so that those are some of the areas um, where, where diversity seems to be suffering and probably where regulation needs to, to pay a little bit more attention to ensure that we have as many people heard as possible so that we can have a complete picture. Just picking up from that, um, what is the role then of universities in helping us tackle some of these challenges uh, as we go forward? What is the role of universities in um, in helping anticipate some of the challenges that we will face, especially as, as technology continues to evolve, as content consumption habits continue to evolve? Uh, maybe, Guy, I'll, 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 I'll go to you with this one. What is the role that universities can play in, in helping us get ahead of some of these, some of these challenges? Mm. Well, I, I think what's happening is that the universities uh, can no longer think they are producing uh, graduates who may go into the tra traditional media industry. Uh, so the question then is, how can uh, graduates take some of these um, principles of ethics and apply them, even if they go into public relations, or if they go in, into social media and become uh, you know, storytellers like that, or if they work for an NGO. And so part of this, I think, is helping them understand that there is a distinctive place for journalism as a, an approach to, to life and, and, and content. So that, you know, for example, people would say that diversity, absolutely, diversity of voices is so good. But within that diversity, what is journalistic? Um, so that, you know, one could posit, uh, and universities can say this to students, here are 30 stories. Which ones are good stories? Which ones are badly told stories? Which ones are dishonest stories? Which ones are unverified stories? So that people coming out of universities can realize it's not diversity as an end in itself. It's about um, uh, what, what is the value add in the diversity and what can they do in their particular sphere of, of, of communications practice? What can they do to add that value? And add it in a sustainable way, and that's I think what Monica was was uh, alluding to as well. The sustainability of quality journalism, whether it's going to be in popular format or not, is a different question. But um, I'm sure this really is is relevant, particularly to the work that Fadija is doing, but also to Mzansi Africa. How, at the end of the day, how do you pay the bills? Because it's easy to produce any old entertainment story, relatively easy. But if you're going to try and do reporting and verification and figure out the complexities of public interest and fend off uh, the pressures of those who, who don't want you to bring information to light. You know, this, this is a different ballgame. And so even if you're an individual, but if you're an institution, it's a bit stronger. But how are you going to deal with that? And I think this is where universities can really get young people to, to understand that the world is about negotiation. You, you learn all these fine things. You're going to be faced with a lot of challenges where these will be put under stress and compromise. How are you going to try and stick to them in a sustainable way? Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to cut to a comment from uh, from one of the viewers. Um, I'm just going to read the comment out. It's uh, and I'd love I'd love for some reactions from across the panel on this uh, comment. Uh, this is from Felgona. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly from Nairobi. Uh, and I'll read it out uh, aloud. My comment is that we must protect journalism as a profession and not take citizen journalism as journalism. Even visiting speaker uh, might not even visiting speakers might not be journalists as we have we have influencers as news anchors. 
I think we as journalists should consider using citizen journalism to get deeper meaning into reporting in terms of analysis and use it for advocacy and policy views to educate and inform. My submission is that citizen journalism complements our work but, not, but does not replace it. Would love to get some uh, reactions from across the panel. Maybe uh, we'll start with you, Kobus, given uh, your work with Food for Zanzi and the importance of citizen journalism uh, there. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree. Um, I think citizen journalism is a way of spreading the spreading the net and getting the um, you know getting a diversity of information and and also practically speaking for us is just being able to, to you know to to reach further and to get to places that the budget just doesn't um, just doesn't allow so but it, it's never it's never a, an like an end in its own um, it's an input to the to the journalistic um, process so I, I i completely i completely agree but i do i, I do believe that um, it's a powerful tool to to get more inputs into a, a newsroom than just whoever is, is lucky enough to be to be on staff. Yeah. Any any other reactions to this point about citizen journalism, uh, Khadija? It's an interesting point. I think that for me, uh, you know, just picking up on the media sustainability issue, you know, against this is that the recognition of the profound crisis news media is in particularly in the so-called global south and uh, i therefore uh, you know I, I had a conversation with some um, philanthropists in south africa several months ago you know who had thought about putting in a new program to create a new you know a new cohort of citizen journalists in rural south africa and yeah, I was very uncomfortable with that program because I do believe that right now, if there is any surplus money for news media lying around, that it should be going up to strength. It should be going into strengthening news media as institutions. It should be going into strengthening journalism as a profession. It should be going into strengthening the development of new forms of journalism. So while I agree that citizen journalism is important and will remain, uh, you know, an element of our broader ecosystem. I think that, you know, for me, Nitin, you know, I'm passionate about, under, you know, us enforcing this understanding of media and news media and the work that we do as a public good. And, you know, and therefore, you know, the work of journalists, it is it is a particular practice. It is a it is it is ascribing to a particular set of ideals. It is doing this work in a certain manner with a certain understanding of uh, you know of what we do and how we do it. And not all citizen journalists are going to want to do that, you know, as a career. I think that citizen journalism is valuable in perhaps building a new cohort of journalists in non-traditional ways. So outside of perhaps the formal journal journalism schools, I've had good experience, I think, in actually, uh, you know, uh, through my digital news site of the Daily Vox, through actually bringing in a new cohort of journalists, you know, who, who didn't have any formal journalistic training. And, you know, they're basically, you know, community storytellers that we then developed into journalists. So there are there is a value for them, but I think that they are, they, you know, our understanding must understand our understanding of the news media rather must be informed by the ecosystem um, as a whole. Thank you, thank you, Khadija. Uh, yes, I wanted to say something, Nigel. Yeah, I, please, I appreciate please go ahead. The comment, I appreciate the comment on um, the, that the last part of the comment that said uh, citizen journalism should be seen as complementary and not replacing journalism, and I agree with that. I think uh, what traditional journalism probably has going for it that maybe citizen journalism needs to develop more is the element of accountability. Uh, they, I think the accountability mechanisms are much more developed in traditional journalism than they may be in citizen journalism. And so maybe that's an area of emphasis we need to be looking at as well. There's one other... I could... Uh, yes, please go ahead. Go ahead, Guy. 
Uh, okay, I, I think uh, Kubus also had a point, but to my point quickly okay, uh, yeah. in relation in relation to your uh, uh, thing about universities. Well, uh, in terms of the original model of excellence, university journalism schools should be also connecting to the community, and so this is a role that universities can play to actually offer journalism courses to citizens. Uh, and then if, uh, as Khadija said, if there's um, um, some money around, you know, you, can you build up the capacity of, of universities to play that role so that there is that, not just a diversity of voices, but a diversity of voices that are aspiring to, to certain standards? Because journalism is a higher level of communication in terms of your ethics, your verification, uh, your, your consideration of public interest. It's not just, uh, you know, communicating to be a celebrity or communicating for a hidden agenda. But I'm sorry, I jumped in. Yes. And no, that's very close to what I wanted to, to say. Um, I, I think we, you know, the genie is out of the bottle and we all know we don't have the gatekeeper role that we used to have. So I think it's also part of not necessarily the university's role to, to educate the public, but um, it's in all our interests that to have a public that um, understands why gen journalistic information is, is valuable. And that was part of our mission with our um, citizen journalism uh, program, to, 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 to make people aware of exactly what, why there's more value to a, to a credible information from a credible source, you know, what that value add is that we, that we give. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was I was hoping we could get to one more uh, audience question, but uh, we time has flown by. Uh, slightly impacted by technical challenges, but time has flown by. Uh, I I want to ask one question, and I'd love love to go around the table, uh, the virtual table, as it were, uh, and get a response from each of you. What is what is the one thing that excites you most about? the next 10 years of journalism in Africa? What is the one thing that excites you personally the most? And maybe, uh, maybe Guy, maybe we can start with you. Well, I, I think the pandemic really showed people that quality information is a premium and it's a matter of life and death and that's good for journalism. And if we build on that going ahead, I think we can we 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 will find a, a public that's prepared to cherish and support and where they can pay for, but also defend journalists who are under attack because um, of the importance of this work, of this contribution to this ecosystem that's got so much going on to, in in the thing. And so, I, I think this is positive, and I think Africa, particularly with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the potential also for Africa-wide collaborations, uh, potential as we see now for journalism to save the public a huge amount of money by exposing tax evasion. All this stuff I think is really good to, it, it says that journalism is needed and wanted and that I think the public in the end will, will give it the support it needs. Thank you, thank you, Gaia. Uh, Monica, maybe you next? Yes, um, am I allowed to say two things instead of one? Um, I'm excited about a new uh, new network that that was just created called the Africa Journalism Journalism Education Network. I think headed by Franz Kruger and a number of other people, and uh, and and that has potential to enable journalism schools in Africa to think together about the future of journalism. And I think that's really powerful. And the fact that we can we don't now have to travel to South Africa to do this and so on, we can do it the way we are talking here. I think that's excellent. I think the other thing that's excellent for me, that's exciting is the, the number of opportunities um, in terms of who can access news have multiplied dramatically in terms of platform, in terms of language, in terms of format. And I think that can only improve the quality of information if it's handled well. Thank you, Monica. Khadija? Um, Nitin, you know, I, I continue to believe that journalism is the best job in the world. It is the most magical job 
uh, you know, and actually seeing a story come together, being part of, uh, of the process of putting a story together, being part of the process of putting a publication together, whether it's digital or print or, you know, or whatever format it is, it is a kind of magic for me. And um, it's what I want to ensure that, you know, that young women, particularly young girls, particularly who tell their elders they want to be journalists, uh, don't get scoffed, don't get ridiculed, that they're able to still say this and, you know, see this as a viable career opportunity, as a viable opportunity to express themselves and their values. Uh, and that is in danger, Nitin. That is, it is, we must be very frank, it is in danger. The, the prospect of journalism being an accessible profession for most people is in danger, particularly in, uh, in a context like ours in, um, in Africa. And for me, um, though that, you know, I don't want to sound alarmist and it's because it is alarming, but I think that there is also a lot of hidden opportunity in that. And um, that is what excites me. It is the recognition of how bad things are and the opportunity that that may bring for us to think about new forms of journalism, new audience strategies, you know, the whole, you know, just rethinking also the roles that we need in the newsroom. Um, it's, it's really, really exciting. Fantastic, thank you. What, Kobus, what about you? Um, I'm very excited about, there's a lot of energy in this um, digital news um, startup space in South Africa, and I think probably in the rest of Africa as well. People um, finding ways of sharing, um, you know, doing journalism differently, pushing against different kind of boundaries that, that have kept us, um, sort of constricted us up, up till now. So, um, yeah, it, this is, it's an exciting space to, to be in. And I think we're going to see different, um, uh, you know, quality, a, a different kind of quality platform um, emerging. Fantastic. Guy, Monica, Khadija, Kobus, thank you so much for spending your time this morning with us. We've only just scratched the surface with some of this discussion, but uh, clearly there's a lot of rich, meaningful uh, debate and discussion to be had about the future of journalism and how and how we can uh, continue to play a role in, uh, in evolving uh, the profession, in making sure we're protecting the ideals uh, of journalism as we move forward. Thank you so much once again for being with us this morning. Uh, you've been extremely gracious panelists. Uh, thank you so much. And with that, let me hand this back over to Dorothy. Thank you so much, Nathan and the panelists for that fascinating discussion. It was what I thought it would be. And it's, it's just exciting to see the optimism for journalism that's evident in your discussion. Apologies to everyone for the technical difficulties at the beginning of the panel, just beyond our control. Anyway, back to the program. We have a busy week coming up here at GNI for Africa, and I'm delighted to give you some information on the sessions. You don't have to register for individual sessions. Just click on the link you want to attend on the day. Coming up tomorrow, we will be hearing all about the Google News Initiative Digital Growth Program. This program provides publishers with training, tools, and other online sources to help them grow their digital business online. These courses are built by publishers for publishers, and we've partnered with industry-leading experts like One IFRA, the International News Media Association, and Financial Times. Workshops and labs cover a variety of topics, such as business strategy, reader revenue, advertising strategy, audience development, data management, and subscriptions. Taught by experts from the news industry, come along and get an insight into what is free of charge training can offer. Ask questions, meet others from the news industry in Africa, if you want to come to this session, it will be happening tomorrow, Tuesday, 26th October at 11.30 East Africa time. We hope to see you there.
On Wednesday, if you're wondering what's happening, we'll be hearing from Google's Gracia Odon, global audience lead at Google, specializing in the News Consumer Insights Program in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Gracia is passionate about data and the power of understanding data in ways that will unlock the publisher's performance. News Consumer Insights provide actionable recommendations about reader engagement, reader revenue based on your Google Analytics data. The aim of this program is to help you identify the reader funnel opportunity that can help increase reader engagement and reader revenue. Gracia will go through the tool, give us some real examples of how publishers have used the insights themselves. Wednesday's session is not to be missed for those who are looking to improve reader revenue and engagement. So we hope to see you back then on Wednesday at 11.30 East African time. Wondering what's happening on Thursday? We will turn our attention to journalists, journalism students, media entrepreneurs, startups, who are responsible for crafting the stories we all read. We will be joined by Kenneth Kiunga, Google News Lab Teaching Fellow for Africa. Having spent over a decade working in the media industry, Ken will give us an overview of the News Lab and introduce us to training tracks. The program provides as part of Google News Initiative's mission to drive innovation in journalism. The News Lab training showcases a wide range of digital tools offered by Google and other open source providers that are available to those working in journalism to empower newsroom to find, verify, and tell stories. Tools such as Advanced Search, Google Trends will help journalists quickly and effectively find credible information and insights that are useful for their day-to-day -day work. Ken's session will sample two tracks to give you an opportunity to what the training is about and how it is delivered. We are very excited to bring this popular training to GNI for Africa, and we really hope to see you on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. East African time. You can also tell others about the training and encourage them to register at the link. And finally, on Friday, we are thrilled to be hosting a panel discussion on how innovation can deepen engagement with journalism in Africa with some amazing panelists, such as Fiona Weeks from Pulse Nigeria, Melissa Mbugua from Africa Podfest. But for now, thank you for joining us for GNI for Africa. And we can't wait to see you every day this week. That will be all for now. Goodbye, Adema, Kwaheri. See you later. Bye-bye.